Okay, thank you guys for coming. Um, I'd like to introduce Lauren Simpson. She is with um, St. Julian's Crossing Wildlife Life Habitat, and she's going to share a little bit with us today about wildscaping, things that we can do in our garden that's going to help the pollinators in our area. So without further ado, I am going to pass it over to Lauren. Thank you so much for being here today. Leah, thank you so much. It's my great pleasure, and I am thrilled to be here to chat about pollinators, insects, and wildscaping, one of my two passions in life. I want to thank Lone Star College, um, Cypher Library, Leah Stark, Lucille Abbott, Claire Gunnels, and so many other people there who made this possible and for the invitation. Uh, I provided a couple of PDF handouts, and maybe you could speak to that, Leah, where those might live. But one of those is a flyer for St. Julian's Crossing Wildlife Habitat, which is simply the name for, oh, it's on the LIFE webpage. Thank you very much, Claire. So on the LIFE webpage, you're gonna find a couple of PDFs. One of them is the flyer for St. Julian's Crossing Wildlife Habitat, which is my family's home garden here in Houston in the Oak Forest community. Um, and it talks a little bit about what we do here uh, on one page and on the second page, it has resources with links that might be useful for you. The second document um, is a list of my sources for this because I stand on the shoulders of giants uh, and I have amazing mentors and resources. So I put those on there, but I also included resources organized by the tips I'm gonna give you today. All hyperlinked so that you can read more about any topic that I speak about briefly today. So I am going to go ahead and start. And I, I kind of, uh, another way to think of this talk is the what, why and how of wildscaping. So I thought it would be really good to talk about what I mean when I say wildscape. So different people have different names for this. Some people call it a habitat garden or a wildlife habitat garden. I just happen to use the word wildscape, but I thought it would, might, be, might be good to have a conversation about what that means. So it's really actually pretty straightforward. A wildscape is any garden that has the primary purpose of supporting wildlife. That's all that it means. But that has ramifications in three areas. So that means that every plant I choose, every design decision I make, and every maintenance decision that I make is done with that primary purpose in mind. How will that support wildlife or will it adversely impact wildlife? So in a suburban or urban area like our home gardens, and that's what I'm going to focus on today, um, these authors, Rainer and West, I'll show you the, a screenshot of their book later. It's a fantastic book, but they talk about how it's not pure ecological restoration. So ecological restoration is what you see in awesome places like the Katy Prairie Conservancy, where they actually try and recreate the coastal Texas prairie as it existed for you know, millennia before human intervention. Um, but that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about what they call a design plant community, which is a hybrid of holder, horticulture and ecology. So that means that it takes the cues from what was there in our prairies originally and tries to translate that to gardens in a community. So we want them to look intended instead of untended. Like I would love to have a wild prairie in my front yard, but I'm thinking my neighbors might not be down with that, right? <laughs> so I translate it so that it still reads garden in these author's words and looks intentional but at the same time provides all of the benefits of a prairie, or at least as many as I can. And I like to say that this kind of gardening is about the two C's. It's about critters and community, both of those things. Does that make sense? And the good news is that I can make choices that please my neighbors at the same time that I meet that primary purpose of my wildlife garden, which is supporting wildlife. So I thought um, that because a picture paint is better than a thousand words, or however the expression goes, I thought I would show you some examples of what wildscapes might look like. And so I have friends in the community who've, who've allowed me to use snapshots of their homes. So this one is in Clear Lake, um, Jerry and Susan Hamby. You can see how this, and by the way, wildscapes, there's not one blueprint. 
they can look more wild or more manicured, right? It's a sliding scale. Think of it that way. And it really depends on the specifics of your land and also your preference. So here, the insides of the garden beds are a little bit wilder than what we might have in a traditional landscape, but see how they've used chunky stone borders to make it reed garden nonetheless. So this is a very good example. This is from Jaime Gonzalez, who's now with uh, the Nature Conservancy and used to be with Katy Prairie Conservancy. He's one of my mentors. He's awesome. I aspire to be Jaime when I grow up, right? So this is his family's home garden. Again, he makes it reed garden by having sharply mowed edges. This one I love. This is my friend Patty's in the Montrose area. This is probably the wildest of the bunch. There are pads, but they're not as visible. You can see a trellis. Again, it depends on your taste and it's a sliding scale. And these are my home gardens. This is St. Julian's Crossing Wildlife Habitat. My house is under 1600 square feet. The front and backyard are comparable. The front yard's about 60% converted to garden beds and we're now about 86% plants native to the eco region. And so you can see how um, I've done certain things. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> I've done certain things to make it look intentional. So stone borders, paths, and so forth, decorative, decorative items. And yet it looks a little bit different, doesn't it? So, vive la différence. So I thought it might also be good to introduce folks to what pollinates in a wildscape. So uh, I, this is normally an interactive class and, and a participatory class, just like my classes at the University of Houston Law Center where I teach, um, on, on something totally different from this, by the way. <laughs> I teach legal writing and research. This is, uh, that's my first passion. This is my other passion. So um, it's normally participatory and those who don't participate have to stay after class to clean the erasers. But I recognize that we're in a, in a web format. So uh, I want you to think in your mind uh, quickly about all those critters that you know that pollinate. So take one moment, think about that. And if you want to put them in the chat real fast, you can do that. Are you seeing anything in the chat, Leah? Let's see, wasps, ooh. Spiders. Oh. Good job. Okay. The answer, lizards. So the answer is yes. <laughs> We're going to talk a little bit about that. So a, a pollinator, an animal pollinator, is any animal that takes the pollen from the male component of the flower and deposits it in the female component of the flower. We have another vote for moth too. I think that's awesome. Oh, awesome. Okay. No one has to stay and clean the erasers. Good job. Okay. So any animal that does that. So I thought I would spend just a few moments talking about this. There are actually some reasons that will become evident that I'm going to spend a moment. I'm going to give you one fun fact about each of these orders or families of insects. And um, we're going to use that information later when we get to the tips. So the best adapted, evolutionarily adapted critters for pollinating are definitely bees. Uh, bees are descended from wasps, and you can think of them as Dr. John UT says, as vegetarian wasps. That's all they are. So their bodies have evolved for most of the species to have lots of hairs that act like dust mops to pick up the pollen. So I want you to take a look at this little bee in the very center here. Whoops, let me go back on the little bit, little white flower there in the middle. So I want you to hold up your pinky finger and I want you to look at the pink of your pinky finger. That pink of your pinky finger is the size of the entire flower head. That's called Texas frog fruit. That bee is smaller than that. So that bee is only a couple of millimeters. So they range in size and color. They can be green, blue, orange, yellow, black, red. It can be as small as a couple of millimeters and as large as from the knuckle to the tip of your thumb. And there are about 4,000, here's the fun fact, species of bee in North America, and the honeybee is not one of them. And who knew that? Bees feed with a tongue that can be shorter. Remember that. Butterflies. So butterflies feed with a long straw-like thing called a, a proboscis. 
Um, it actually absorbs through capillary action. They can be as small as about a thumbnail all the way to the span of the palm of your hand. And fun fact, at my home gardens, which is not big in the middle of the city, I just documented last month my 50th species of butterfly. If you build it, they will come. Moths, as someone noted in the chat. So moths are primarily active at night, but some of these you see here are diurnal or daytime. I have no idea how many moths we have at St. Julian's Crossing, but can't they be beautiful? Look at the fuzzy little one on the left. It's like a teddy bear, right? So moths like butterflies also feed with a proboscis. They just happen to be a bit fuzzier. And here's your fun fact about butterflies and moths. They actually don't have hair. What looks like hair on them is actually specialized scales. Flies. So I had no idea that flies can pollinate. Flies feed with a spongy little mouth part that kind of sticks down, and so it's shorter than the tongue of many bees or definitely shorter than the proboscis of butterflies and wasps, so keep that fact in your head. So uh, actually, depending on the species, can be pretty good pollinators. And some of these, like the two on the bottom left and a few of the others, those are called hoverflies. And some of those uh, species, their larvae are predaceous, meaning that they can eat your white flies, mealybugs, aphids, scale in your garden when they're babies, and when they're adults, they're pollinators. So that's pretty cool. Um, the fun fact about these is that if you look at that bottom row, the two on the bottom, the bottom left and middle, those look kind of like a wasp and a bee, don't they? So they are exhibiting what we call Batesian mimicry, which means they mimic things that can cause harm, even though these flies can't bite or sting you. That's a survival technique. And someone mentioned, I think it was Claire, wasps. So I am one with wasps. Yes, wasps eat our butterfly caterpillars, but in the wild, only one out of every 100 butterfly eggs becomes an adult anyway. And that's the circle of life. And here's the gorgeous thing about wasps. Not only do the adults use their tongues to feed on nectar and thus they can pollinate, although they tend not to be as fuzzy as bees, but the babies, the larvae eat insects. And so the mama wasps will paralyze those garden pests and other things, but things like white flies, mealybugs, scales, caterpillars, things like that, and put them in the nest for the babies to feed on. These guys keep my garden pest free and for the last five years. They are a huge part of that. And I haven't used pesticides in five years because of that. And I like to say the four Bs, beetles, bugs, bats, and coming birds. <laughs> Basically any animal that feeds on the nectar of the plant or the pollen and thereby transfers pollen. Okay, so remember how different they are in size and shape and how different their mouth parts are. So I wanna spend a few minutes talking about the why of wildscapes. So now we can see what a wildscape is and what uses it, but I think it's really good to have a conversation about why we need them, because why the heck should we change our gardening practices? You deserve to know. So this was a study done in 2006, so 14 years ago, am I mathing right? You always tell me I am. All right, I'm just a professor. Anyway, <laughs> uh, it was done 20, uh, 14 years ago, and it concluded that native pollinators, not including honey, uh, provide $60 billion a year in eco services that we're going to talk about in a minute. And they said, the author said that that number was low. So they provide a lot for our economy. And again, this is without taking into account the honeybee contribution through pollination and honey production. So what do they do for us? And I'm gonna go from pollinators to insects generally. So about two thirds of our crop, which translates to about a third of what's on our plates for our meals, requires pollination services almost uniquely by animals and primarily by insects in order to grow. And that's billions of dollars uh, in the market a year. And depending on um, the metric that you read, either 75 to 95% of flowering plants, so this is broader than crops, 
must have animal pollinators to propagate. So why is that important? Well, future generations of pollinators are gonna need things to eat too. So we need pollinators to help feed future pollinators. But plants also prevent erosion control. Um, they, they provide erosion control so the soil doesn't wash off relatedly. They help sequester water in their roots. And plants, as a general rule, sequester carbon in their roots as well. But insects are also a huge part of the food chain, and I'm going to go further than pollinators and talk about insects. So we see the frog and the lizard here. So reptiles and amphibians will eat insects directly, as will some small mammals. And if you look and see what the squirrel has in its mouth, you see a nut. So of course, if a lot of our plants require pollinating services by insects and others to produce berries and nuts and fruits, then little critters like this squirrel are gonna go pretty darn hungry if that plant needs an animal pollinator and we don't have them. But I really wanna focus on the example of our bird. So we know the old adage, the early bird gets the worm. So that comes from the fact that about a quarter of adult birds diet is insects. So adult birds actually have a much broader diet than their babies. They can eat, depending on the species, seeds, fruits, berries, grains, things like that. But about a quarter of overall their diet is insects. That variety of food source is not true for their babies. So among terrestrial bird species, not aquatic, but terrestrial, According to Dr. Doug Tallamy, I'm going to show you his books later. He's the man on this. Um, about 96% of terrestrial bird species, babies, eat only insects and other arthropods. They cannot digest berries, nuts, and fruits, and grains. They can eat only insects. And the parents tend to bring their babies soft-bodied insects and in particular, caterpillars of moths and butterflies. The reason for that is they're high in fat and protein and easy to swallow and digest. So if, and that begs the question, like how many does a mama bird need for the clutch of chicks, right? So again, Dr. Doug Tallamy in Bringing Nature Home, and again, he mentions it in his new book, Nature's Best Hope, um, cited studies, and I think also may have participated in studies to try and quantify them. So they studied um, Carolina chickadees, I think in the Northeastern part of the United States. And they're like, so how many insects does a mama need to bring to a single clutch of her babies at a time over the life until they fledge? And the answer is astounding. It's not dozens, it's not hundreds, it's thousands, thousands of insects for a single clutch of babies with a single mama. So if we don't have insects and if we don't have a lot of them, what else do we lose? Maybe birds. We already know from the studies that especially came out last year, what a hard time birds are having in our, in our continent. Insects also are really good at providing decomposition services. So they recycle dung, they break down dead plant matter, they decompose carrion. And when they die, some of them actually um, uh, sort of reintroduce nitrogen into the soil through their decaying bodies. So they, they provide huge decomposition services. And like I was mentioning before with those hoverflies, the larvae of which eat your pests in the garden, insects provide at around four and a half billion dollars annually in pest control, either predators or parasitoids where they lay their egg inside of the target insect and it eats it from the inside out. Yes, nature is brutal. Anyway, <laughs> so they provide a lot of pest control services. So we need them. The problem is, and this is part of the why y'all, that insects are in a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble. We could spend a whole day, a whole week on the sources of insect decline overall. We don't have a week. So in the interest of time, I'm going to show you this screen and just mention a few of these. Some of the big, and again, scientists are still trying to figure out how all of these things play together to push down the numbers of insects overall and how they affect different orders and families and genera of insects. 
The bottom line is all of these things can harm insects and are harming them. Uh, chief among those is pesticide use and herbicide use. And by the way, private homeowners are kind of the worst foot for foot in the use of pesticides and herbicides because who reads those containers, right? We tend to overuse. Habitat loss. That means that we take what was pristine prairie before and we convert it to our own use. And yes, we're here. We're not going anywhere. We're here. Fragmentation means that what little patches are left are not connected. So they don't form a corridor, generally speaking. It's a patch here and there. And that might be hard for those teeny little insects to get around. You with me? Degradation means where humans are, we tend to compress the soil or rob it of its nutrients or introduce things that make things less beneficial for insects. So there's a lot of different problems that drive down insects. And in fact, entomologists, entomologists, y'all, are telling us that at all kinds of levels, international, national, state, city, and our individual level, we've got to do something and do something now. Because although the studies are ongoing, although there's years and years of research yet to go, to understand all of those drivers and to understand where and how insects are declining precipitously, it's happening. And in fact, their overall numbers are declining significantly and not just in one place. And they're calling us to do something now while still researching. So just to give you a taste of how, and I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, just to give you a taste of how bad it is for insects right now, I wanted just to mention a couple of studies. It'll take me 30 seconds, but I think it's worth it. The first was done that was published in uh, 2017. It was 27 years of data collection in Germany at 63 nature protection areas that did not diminish or decrease or have pesticide or other use in them over that nearly 30 years. And they discovered that over that 27 years, there was a 76% decline in the overall biomass of flying insects. All they did was flying insects. That's, that's horrifying, that's bad. Likewise, in June of 2019, Manga Bay News, which focuses a lot on tropical um, issues, interviewed 24 entomologists on six continents representing 12 countries and asked them on a scale of zero, which is no problem at all, to 10, which is the problem with the decline in insect biomass is dire, where would you rank it? None of the 24 said below an eight, some said 10. So it's, it's not good. And, and we, can't, we can't be unaware of that. We need to be aware of it. But are you ready for the rejoice and be glad moment? Cause, oh my gosh, I know I am, right? And I give this talk. <laughs> Here's the rejoice and be glad moment. You ready? Right here, right now, right in our own gardens, we form a critical link in the chain that's going to save insects and thus the ecosystem. Right here, right now, right at home. It's empowering. Yeah. It's multiple levels. I'm not going to lie. It's we a link in a chain, and a chain is comprised of multiple links, each of which is critical to the structure of the chain, right? Can't pull a chain with a missing link or a broken link. So, yes, there has to be work at the international, national, state, municipal, and individual levels. But it's hard for me as an individual and for us as individuals to do a lot on the international level directly. But by God, we can do something on the individual level. And a cup of coffee gets me up in the morning, right? We are a critical link and we can do this. So Dr. Doug Tallamy says it this way. He says, now for the first time in history, gardening at our homes, y'all, has taken on a role that transcends the needs of the gardener. Like it or not, gardeners have become important players in the management of our nation's wildlife. It is now within the power of individual gardeners to do something that we all dream of doing to make a difference. Are you with me? That's so cool, right? Okay, 
When we have our individual gardens at home, the uh, researchers talk about it as creating stepping stones or biological corridors or bio corridors. That is that teeny little bee that is like only a couple of millimeters long cannot get from my garden in Oak Forest all the way to Memorial Park to get what it needs to survive and to feed its babies. But by gum, it can get from my garden to my next door neighbors to two houses down. See, when we have these gardens, we create stepping stones. Dr. Doug Tallamy in his new book, um, Nature's Best Hope, I'll show you a screenshot of that later. He calls it homegrown national park. Isn't that cool? We can create a national park by virtue of making these stepping stones so that critters can move back and forth. Because we're not gonna go anywhere, we're here. Houston's here, there we are. But we can coexist, okay? Are we ready to talk about how to do it? Me too. All right, before I do that, I cannot more highly recommend these two books by Dr. Doug Tallamy. Um, Bringing Nature Home is over 10 years old. Uh, the Nature's Best Hope just came out. It was published in February of this year, I believe. Outstanding. He's an entomologist who doesn't write like an entomologist. <laughs> and if you look at his uh, website there, you can find a lot of his YouTube talks. He speaks just like you and me. It's awesome. So highly recommended. So let's talk about practical steps, y'all. And I saved a good amount of time for this. I would recommend these books on the how of wildscaping. The Living Land, uh, <laughs> my gift list too, y'all. Uh, the Living Landscape was written by Dr. Tallamy and uh, Rick Dark, who's a landscaper who does this kind of landscaping. If you are a beginning gardener, this is the book for you. Um, uh, planting in a post wild world is the one I talked about before. It's for a more advanced level. And they don't always advocate using all native plants, but what they talk about is really good stuff. And finally, there's garden revolution. This is way above my gardening level, but I still have it anyway. This is more for advanced gardeners. So outstanding books, highly recommended. So let's go through our tips, y'all. About 10, 15 minutes, can you work with me? Tip number one, support the home team. I mean by this, that we should primarily plant plants that are native to our area of Texas. So what's a native plant? Um, to kind of paraphrase Dr. Tallamy, he talks about the idea of time, place, and community. You can't think of a native plant in the abstract. It has to be, it's native because over eons, over millennia, it has co-evolved with animals in the same area in order to become kind of a, a, a system where they support each other. That's what a native plant is. And on the handouts that you have there that correspond to this, I give you several resources where you can do things like type in your zip code and it tells you where you can find native plants. If anyone has questions about that after, I'm happy to answer those. So in our area of Texas, we're in the uh, Western Gulf Coastal Plains eco region. You can find this on the EPA's website, um, but we want to, you know how big Texas is, it's like as big as France. And so I probably want to be planting plants that have grown in the sort of bluish area on the coast, rather than stuff that's from the panhandle or maybe from um, the, the hill country, just because probably more critters have evolved to eat it. And speaking of that, the reason we primarily want native plants in our gardens is that more critters can eat them. So according to um, a study that Dr. Tallamy cites in Bringing Nature Home, at some point in their life cycle, larva, adult, so forth, the um, plant-eating insects, about 90-ish percent of them, are what we call specialists. So a specialist insect is one that can feed on only the nectar leaf or pollen of plants in a particular family, genus, or species. So if I bring in a plant from uh, Asia or South America, maybe an insect that feeds on the leaf can eat that leaf, but the chemicals are gonna be wildly different from what it evolved with. 
So I'm just going to check more boxes and probably support more critters if I have plants with which they've co-evolved. Does that make sense? Um, they're also hardier in our climate. So our plants that have evolved in this region of Texas in the coastal prairie, they are used to being nuked in the summer and drowned in the spring, right? So they've adapted for that. So it's not that every native plant that I have selected in my garden that we can select from this area is drought tolerant. Some of them have evolved to have wet feet near rivers or lakes. But a lot of them have evolved to withstand drought in the summer in the open prairie. So I've chosen primarily those. I don't, 60% of my front lawn is garden beds, y'all. I don't have a sprinkler and I don't have a watering system water during drought as needed here and there. And, and I'm not, I do it two or three times a week to certain plants, but I, I spot water because I don't need to spend money on a watering system for plants that have adapted not to need it. So we save time and we save money. They also sequester water and therefore purify it as it goes down to the water table better, depending on the depth of the root. So like I said before, the deeper the root, the more water and carbon it can sequester. This is um, from the USBG. It's a slice of a prairie. I don't think the coastal prairie, maybe the central stage prairie. Um, the line in the middle here, I'm going to run my cursor over it, is the top of the soil. So some prairie plants, because they've evolved to withstand prairie fires where the top of the plant dies, but the bottom persists, or to go through a lot of drought and so forth and flooding have evolved particularly deep roots. Some prairie plants have roots that go down almost 14 feet deeper than a human adult is tall. And whereas according, I think it's to the Katy Prairie Conservancy, St. Augustine lawns can sequester in the average rainstorm like half an inch of water, in a prairie, not necessarily my garden, but in a prairie with deep rooted plants, it can be inches of water. So I want that in my garden. <laughs> like we need that in Houston, right? With our flooding problems. So it's not that every plant in my garden has these deep roots, but the deeper the root, the more water it can absorb in a regular rainstorm and the more carbon it takes out of the air, which is, you know, is important to help reduce climate change. Plus, even if our native plants are aggressive, if they get out, they were always here. The problem is when we bring in aggressive plants that are not native to our Eco region, and that nothing here has evolved to eat. So this is a shot of a Chinese tallow tree. I think it may also be called a tree of, no, not tree of heaven, Chinese tallow or China berry tree. Um, it was used in landscaping up through maybe the last few decades. It is personally responsible for the demise of several prairie remnants. Nothing eats it. It's prolific, it's aggressive, and it always gets out because birds love the berries and they deposit them elsewhere. So we want to make sure that if we incorporate plants that are not native to our ecoregion, they are not invasive. And if you Google, you can find invasive plant list. And by the way, I'm just gonna read off some common landscaping plants that are considered invasive, either by the Houston Audubon Society or by other groups, Chinese tallow, Bradford pear, Mandina, also called tree of heaven, ligustrum, elephant ear, pampas grass, Chinese privet, and I hate to say it, Japanese honeysuckle. They're aggressive and nothing here can eat the leaf and therefore they outcompete. That's the, that's the most important tip. And the more I've gone to native plants, the more the biodiversity in our gardens has exploded. Second, avoid pesticides, pretty simple. Highly recommend this book by Jessica Walliser, Attracting Beneficial Bugs to Your Garden. She not only explains how to bring in those bugs that will take care of your insects naturally, but how to organize like vegetable gardens with partner plants, companion plants that bring in the very critters that will eat the critters eating your cabbage, for example. So pesticides are equal opportunity killers. And if I use them to get rid of my pest insects, they also will kill my other insects. So just be patient. When we get an infestation of aphids, uh, we have like a couple of weeks um, where the aphids are uh, bad and then 
they attract predators and in a couple more weeks there's nothing. Mix it up. So variety is the spice of life, including for insects. Why? Remember I told you we'd come back to the shape and size of our pollinators and how they feed? This is it, folks. Full circle, back to the beginning. So if a, a, an insect with a large body might need a large plant to perch on, and an insect with a tiny shallow mouth part may need shallow flowers. So I want to choose flowers in different sizes and colors, again, to support the body size of various pollinators and also colors because insects see differently from humans and they see differently from each other. So, for example, bees have kind of a hard time distinguishing red from green, but they can really see purples, yellows and whites. Butterflies and hummingbirds see a lot of red. So if I have a wide variety, I'm probably attracting more critters. I also want to choose flowers with different structures. So again, their mouth parts are shaped differently. So having different structures is a really good thing. I also want to choose flowers that bloom in different seasons. So it's easy to have plants flowering in the spring, but less so in the fall. The worst thing is I invite them in in the spring and then the buffet closes in the fall. So when you're selecting plants, check for the bloom time. And the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center Native Plant Index is a great resource for finding flower si or size of the plant, bloom time, and so forth. Tip four, pile it up. So both for aesthetic and biological reasons, I want to plant my species of plants in clusters. And um, Flo Hanna with the Houston Audubon Society used to say, you kind of want odd numbered clusters aesthetically. So in clusters of three, five, or seven are good rules of thumb. So why do I want to plant them in clusters? So if I plant plants in clusters, it has a more intentional look and makes it read garden more. Does that make sense? That's that community focus. But the biological function is that it also might help critters flying fly high overhead see those colors and be attracted to them and know there's food waiting. Likewise, some bees especially practice what we call flower constancy, where they like to tap out the pollen or, uh, or nectar of one, per, usually pollen of one particular plant species before moving to another. So if you put it together, it's like you're giving them a shopping mall where they can shop at a bunch of different stores there instead of making them go all over the place hunting for the same flower. You can also combine these clusters. So look here, I have um, a goldenrod and an aster together. So your clusters can be also things that are uh, together. And I'll probably end with this tip because I recognize we're at 1040. Am I okay, Leah, to keep going? Okay, thanks for, I get excited y'all, so. <laughs> Embrace imperfection. This was new to me when I started this adventure. So, you know, in the winter after we have freezes, what's the first thing we want to cut back? Oof. All those ugly dead plants and their stems, right? And I want to cut off those seed heads. The thing is that about 70% of our native bees, again, not honeybees, about 70% nest in the ground and about 30% nest above ground, sometimes in wood or in stems. Remember, they can be teeny tiny or in crevices. So for those bees that nest above ground, they will go into pithy or hollow stems and lay their eggs. So if I cut back those stems before the spring when I'm ready to plant again, I may be throwing away baby bees. That horrified me when I found out. And leaving the seed heads up, seed heads up not only gives some structure for the eye to look at aesthetically, but birds will feed on those. The other thing is I don't bag and put my leaves on the curb. I use them as mulch in my gardens because a lot of critters overwinter in leaves and they can't really get under mulch. So this is a twofer benefit here. Likewise, I may have some chrysalis or pupa or, um, or uh, uh, blanking on the word, but anyway, I might have some pupa from butterflies or moths 
cocoon, thank you, that have been in the leaves, the leaf falls to the ground. And if I compost those leaves, those get thrown away too. And finally, I'm gonna let my early spring wildflowers go in little patches in my front yard because sometimes that's all there is for critters to feed on. So I just have a conversation with my neighbors about why I'm not mowing these little patches and they're cool with it. Again, it's about critters and community. So I'm gonna just leave it at that and say, happy wildscaping. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we can open it up for questions. You can type it in our chat box, or if you wanna unmute yourself, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. I have a couple comments. Thank you, it was very informative. And this is the comments in the chat box. So do you recommend um, not using Augustine and doing some kind of seed grasses? Or? So that's the $20,000 question, Claire. Thank you for raising it. So, so I, you know, until I win the lottery and I can redo all of this, <laughs> Um, I kind of let things go. Um, so we inherited the house with St. Augustine with some Bermuda grass in. And it, they don't really feed a lot and they have really shallow roots and they take a lot of watering, right? So my husband and I don't waste water on the lawn anymore. What we've chosen to do instead, Claire, is we've chosen actually to create garden beds to take the place. Uh, I think I have a question. Remind me to come back to that, Julia, about a ranch. So to take the place of the lawn. So I've actually supplanted it with beds. Um, that said, there are some ground covers that are native that you can um, promote in lieu of grass and you can walk on. So my favorite is called Texas frog fruit. Remember when we held up our pinky fingers and looked at that little white flower head? So that's the flower of Texas frog fruit. It is my one of my absolute favorite native plants. It's a ground cover. You can walk on it, you can mow it. If you don't mow it or trim it back or walk on it, it can get maybe a foot high with the flower heads. It uh, stays green all year. It can have wet feet, so it's good for rain gardens or areas where you have water that collects. It can be nuked, so it's good for bone dry areas. I never waste time watering mine, I don't have to. Uh, it stays green all year. Um, it the Leaves are the host plant for at least two local butterfly species. And the little flowers bloom about six months out of the year from spring until almost winter. Uh, yes, it, it can be in full sun or it can be in part shade, Texas frog fruit. That's the beauty of it. It doesn't like full shade, but it can take part shade. So as long as it gets a couple hours of sun a day, it's probably cool. This stuff is aggressive, it's native, so it'll take over the world and you want that, right? So I stopped counting at 30 species of insect feeding on its little flowers. I love this stuff. Um, the other thing that you can use also is there's um, something called Carolina Pony's Foot, P-O-N-Y-S-F-O-O-T. It is a native ground cover in the morning glory family, I think. It just pops up naturally. Um, you can't, I don't know if you can really buy it at most uh, stores, but it's probably, happening like the frog fruit in your in your garden naturally now or in your lawn. There is something called a uh, horse herb, H-O-R-S-E-H-E-R-B, one word, or straggler daisy. It is native to our area of Texas, although some places list it that way, but it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere here. So uh, it, you can walk on it, though not as much as the Texas frog fruit, but it's soft. It has little yellow flowers that pollinators can feed on. It can take full sun or even full shade. So those are some examples of ground covers. The Native Plant Society of Texas Houston chapter, if you go to its website, it has native plant information in a PDF format. If you go there, it actually has a whole list of native ground covers. And it has more than what I've just mentioned. And it organizes native plants by function, so ground cover, by how much light they take, so shade gardens, by how much water they take. So rain gardens, you with me? So fantastic resource and it's on those handouts. 
So the website is the Native Plant Society of Texas Houston chapter. Um, I have the hyperlink on the PDF resources that are on the website. Did that answer your question? Um, Did you want to go back to the ranch? Yes. Would you read that to me? Um, they just asked if, sorry, let me go back to, have you ever visited the, is that Sila Bamberger Ranch? If not, highly recommended to tour this facility. So I have not, and now I will. Thank you. I so appreciate that. Any other questions, y'all? I have, a, I have a lizard in my house. <laughs> Do I have to feed it? <laughs> Do you mean it just sort of appeared or the, it's a pet? It's, no, it, it just sort of appeared and I, we tried to catch it and set it free, but now I'm afraid it's going to die because I can't catch it. <laughs> so the best thing, someone is suggesting putting it back outside. So if you can catch it, I would definitely do what you're already trying to do, which is to really relocate it to its natural home. Uh, it depends on what kind of lizard it is. They're insect insectivores, so they eat insects. So I, I don't know if if you put down little insects for it, if it will eat them. Um, so <laughs> it may be leaving a door open for it. Um, they're super hard to catch. <laughs> Especially those little anoles, the green and brown ones, right? They're holy anole. They are hard to catch. <laughs> the best bet is just to keep doing what you're doing, Claire. I'll get my daughter to come and do it. She's very quick. <laughs> it wouldn't survive in my my house. My cat would get it. Uh-huh. <laughs> and we have three dogs, all rescue dogs, all wonderful, but they do like to play. So, yeah. Are there any other questions? This has been amazing. I just it just opened up a whole new world. So this is like, and I didn't even get to the last tip, which I can do if, if folks would like, I can talk about that last tip and then I can just give you my two big picture thoughts, but I don't want to interrupt questions. We have 10 minutes left. Is that okay, Claire? Yeah, love it. But I don't want to cut off questions, y'all. So is everyone cool with that? think so. So, yeah, <laughs> so what I'm, gonna do is, I'm gonna go back to the last tip and then I'm gonna give you just two ideas for starting because to begin the begin, if you know what that means, then welcome to my world. If you have to begin, <laughs> um, I'm afraid I do. <laughs> yeah, I always say, if you know what it means, it's like when I give my talks and I say, those who don't participate have to clean the erasers after class. And if you're old enough to know what that means, then welcome to my world, right? So it's the same thing. Okay, so the last tip is stock the nursery, y'all. So when I first started, I made the mistake of thinking, well, it's natural to think about the adults of insects, right? Because that's what we see most. We don't see the caterpillars or the larvae. We see the beetles, the adult beetles, like lady beetles. We see butterflies, we see bees. I never thought about their babies. And I thought that maybe the babies ate the same things as the adults, but it turns out I was, I was wrong. So um, the one thing I like to say is that we need to plant plants not only to be sources of nectar and pollen, because our adult pollinators um, will eat, you know, pollinators in particular, they feed on nectar and they also can feed on pollen. But we need to think of plants that will feed uh, the babies of those pollinators. So caterpillar stage for butterflies and moths. Um, and larval stage for things like bees and wasps and beetles. So some of the larvae of uh, beetles and, and wasps and so forth are predaceous, like I said before, they eat other insects and they keep our garden healthy and balanced. But others of them eat leaves or pollen. So talking about butterfly and moth caterpillars, um, they need to eat leaf matter and so they are primarily specialist, meaning they can eat the leaf of only as plants in a certain family, genus, or species. So quick question, participation again. What do monarch butterfly caterpillars eat? Milk weed, you got it. So that's the genus Asclepius. 
and they pretty much can't eat anything except plants in that genus. So we need to make sure that we have milkweed, and particularly those that are, they co-evolved with, but whatever, milkweed in that genus in our garden, or else we're feeding only the adults and not their babies. And what's true for monarchs is true for almost all other lepidopteran caterpillars, so butterflies and moths. So if we want black swallowtails, we want to have um, things in the carrot families, parsley, fennel, uh, dill, things like that, and even rue. The other thing is that um, baby bees eat pollen, which was really cool. And so we want to have more of those native plants because some of those baby bees are specialists on pollen, not all, but the minority of them are specialists so again, we want those native plants. I told you earlier that about 70% of our native bees nest in the ground. So you can think of most of our native bees, except for um, bumblebees and a few others, as solitary bees or like single moms. So a solitary nesting bee is that where the female has her own nesting tunnel or hole. So maybe it's like a common entrance, but they each have their own section, or maybe they just have totally set separate holes in the ground. But 70% of our native bees are uh, nesting in the ground, and a whole bunch of those are solitary and don't have a communal nest like bumblebees or like the non-native So I want to make sure I have exposed soil that is not mulched in an area that's sunny, well-draining, and dry, where these mama bees can make their nesting holes. This little uh, furrow bee gal, I came across her in the garden in an area that I didn't plant in much. Look at that gorgeously, perfectly round hole. And there she is sticking her little head out. Hmm. Is lay her eggs in there, put in pollen, and close it off. And yes, Claire says monster hordage, you're right. Wasps also, some of them will nest in the ground as well, including solitary wasps um, and also like some of our uh, some of our wasps that are good pollinators and get rid of our pests, and some of them like hornets and yellow jackets that nest collectively. And here's the thing about wasps and bees. Only the female bees have stingers. Males don't. Go girls. And yeah. And likewise, the ones that are solitary nesters are not protecting a communal nest, and so they're not aggressive. I have literally never been stung by a bee in my gardens. I've been doing this since 2014. If you don't get in their way, and if they're a solitary nester, if I don't step on them or touch them, they're not going to sting me. Same with wasps, by the way. Now, if they're guarding a communal nest, like those paper wasps or a hornet or yellow jacket, and I get near their nest, they're going to come after me. Does that make sense? Because they're protecting the, the collective. So that's all I wanted to say about that is think about the babies. And then finally, in my last couple of minutes, I often get asked, how do I even begin? Like, where do I start? Like, you look at something like this and it, in a way, it's really inspiring when you see this photo, but in a way, it's kind of intimidating, right? Like, oh my gosh, I could never do that. And the answer is, you don't have to do this. I like to say that it's more about the number of people who have these wildlife gardens at their home to create those stepping stones, and it is about the size of the individual gardens. 10 foot by 10 foot is a pretty good, so like one garden bed, that's enough. Now, of course, the more garden beds you have turned out this way, the more critters you bring in. But if you don't have the time, don't do it. So I guess my first piece of advice is start small. This kind of wildscaping is not hard gardening because you're working with nature, it's just different gardening. If you don't, you need to be realistic about your time. Um, you know, like if you have littles at home or if you're working full time or something, it, if you don't have the time for it, yeah, Claire says I'm going to start with ground cover. Absolutely. So start where you start. Again, it's not so much the size as the fact that you have something. And then you can really devote time for it and make it look intentional. 
and learn the tricks of the trade. The second thing is don't reinvent the wheel, y'all. I got where I am today because I realized I was in over my head immediately and I found people in local groups who could help me. Again, it's about critters and community. That's the beauty of it. So things like our local Native Plant Society of Chapters. We have one in Clear Lake. We have one in Houston. They have regular meetings in, uh, outside of the summer. Fantastic resources. Things like the Butterfly Enthusiast of Southeast Texas, which is um, our local chapter of the North American Butterfly Association. Things like Texas Master Naturalists and Texas Master Gardeners. Um, we can think about getting those certifications. One day when I'm not working full time and doing two jobs like I am now, <laughs> one day I aspire to have those certifications. But you can connect with people in those groups and even just local gardening groups, y'all. Those people, we share plants, we communicate, all that kind of stuff. So um, start small, you don't reinvent the wheel. That's that. Thank you so much. All right, are there any last minute questions before we log off? Here y'all. Lots and lots of thanks. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. This was very informative and um, this is being recorded. So it will be put up on the life web page. Correct, Claire? Okay. Yeah, she says yes. Okay. So we'll have that up as soon as we can. All right. Thank you so Thank much. You, Thank you, I so appreciate it. It's great. Thank you. Everybody have a good day. Bye. Thanks. Bye. I'm going to go sign off now. <laughs> See y'all again. I so appreciate it. it